Welcome to the Creating iPad Apps with JavaScript using Titanium screencast. We'll be modifying and building off the iPhone project we created in our previous screencast titled Building iPhone Apps with JavaScript using Titanium. So we suggest you first watch that screencast to get up to speed on how to install and set up Titanium and how to build many of the basic app features we'll be using today. In our first iPhone Titanium screencast, we mentioned that we were submitting the app to the App Store. We wanted to let you know that we had to add some extra code in order to get the app approved. Since our app played videos longer than 10 minutes over a cell network, Apple required the use of HTTP Live, and we needed to include a baseline 64 kilobits per second audio-only HTTP Live stream. Since we don't currently have the resources to do that, we decided to include a check for a Wi-Fi connection and make video playback Wi-Fi only. We'll show you how to do this in this screencast. The iPad's larger screen real estate allows for a wider range of possible navigation structures and layouts. The most iPad-specific layout is called the Split View layout, which, in landscape orientation, has a master window to the left and a detail window to the right. In portrait orientation, the detail window fills the screen, and the skinny master window becomes a popover window linked off a button in the top left of the navigation bar. The guideline is that the master window acts as the app's main navigation, while the detail window displays the majority of the content. Apple's Mail app for the iPad is a good example of a split view app, with a list of messages in the master window and message content in the detail window. Let's create our new project in Titanium and select iPad from the Project Type menu. Then, we'll fill in the rest of the app details and hit Create Project. To follow along with this screencast, you'll need to download several assets including images and support functions. They're available to download in a zip file on screencasts.org. Be sure to download and extract these into the Resources folder. We've included an app.js file which has some code we'll reuse from our iPhone project. Let's open the project folder in our text editor of choice. At the top of our app.js file, above the iPhone project code, let's include three files which we'll discuss in more detail shortly. We'll use the ti.include command to do this. First in our app, let's create a function called notConnectedAlert to display when we're not connected to the internet. This will create an alert dialog with a title and message that tells the user they aren't connected to the internet. We have one button in the alert named Continue. Then we show the alert dialog. Right outside this function, let's do an initial check to see if we're online when the app loads by checking the boolean ti.network.online. If false, we'll call our notConnectedAlert function. We'll be placing checks like this throughout the app whenever we need to get data from the internet. Our iPhone app was structured around a tab group. We had a latest tab and a topics tab. The topics table view drilled down to a list of episodes for each topic, and whenever an episode row was tapped, it played the corresponding screencast. We'd like to keep all of that functionality in our iPad app, but we'd also like to do something with the extra screen real estate that we couldn't do with the iPhone. So we'll be reusing some code from the iPhone project, but only the code that creates our table views and navigation. We'll be writing new code to play back the videos. Let's create a window called Tab Group Window, which will contain the tab group code used in our previous iPhone project. The reason we need to do this is because the master view cannot accept a tab group as its root. It requires a window for it to behave properly. Now that we've done that, we're going to create a new navigation group that will represent the detail side of our app. We'll first create a detail window, setting its title to Welcome, and then we'll create a detail nav with a Create Navigation Group command, setting its background image to grid.png and its window to our detail window. Creating a navigation group for the detail side gives us the option of pushing on or popping off any windows onto the detail area. Now, we'll create the actual split view, assigning our detail nav as the detail view and the tab group window as the master view. We'll open the split view in just a second, after all the tab group code from the previous iPhone project. Just remember, it's not enough to just create objects like this in Titanium. You have to open them. We'll also add an event listener for when visible, 
which will add the button at the top left of the navigation bar when in portrait mode, but null it out when in landscape. Now, we have the code we copied in from our previous iPhone project. We need to make a quick edit to where we open the tab group in this code. Before we open the tab group, we need to add the tab group to our tab group window. Then, after we open the tab group, we're going to open the split window. If we launch the app now in Titanium, we'll see that our split view layout is displaying correctly. If we rotate the simulator by pressing Command plus the left or right arrows, we'll see the two layout variations. And if we click through our tabs and table views in the master view, we'll see that they are all functioning as expected. Great! With all of that extra space in the detail view, we thought it would be nice to not only display the video here, but also the show notes in script. So, we decided to have a video player in the top of the detail view, and then a scrollable web view below it, which will contain each episode's show notes and script. We'll also create a nice little welcome page for the detail view when the app first loads. So, let's create the web view for the show notes and script by calling titanium.ui.createWebView. For now, we're not going to pass in any parameters. We'll just add it to the detail window. Next, we're going to create the welcome view that will appear in the detail view when the app loads. We're going to have a little bit of fun with this and create a screencasts.org logo with the beam cycling through different colors. So we'll create an image view named screencasts image with its image parameter set to our image path. We'll also set the background color to a hex value of a red and then set some positioning parameters. Setting the bottom to zero and right to zero aligns the view to the bottom right corner. We're also setting the width and height here to the actual dimensions of the image. Setting the view's size like this, along with the bottom right positioning, is our way of positioning the image so that it looks good in both portrait and landscape orientations. If you don't set these variables, Titanium will adjust your images so they scale to fit, which we don't want in this case. Our screencast's image has transparency where the beam should be, so the red background color will show through for the bar color. We'll then add the screencast's image to our detail window and set a Boolean value that we'll call screencast's image is loaded to true. We'll come back to this in a minute. Now, we want to animate the background color that shows through in the screencast's beam from red to orange to blue and back again to red. We'll call animate on our screencast's image, passing in an animation we've called animation1. We've put the code for this animation into a support file called colorcycle.js, which we've included in the top of our app.js. You'll see that we create three animations with titanium.ui.createAnimation, setting duration to 5000, which is 5 seconds, and background color to hex values for orange, blue, and red, respectively. The background color that we set here is the destination for the animation. You could also set other variables to animate, such as position, size, opacity, and so on. You can also set the repeat count, whether or not the animation should reverse, the animation's curve, and many other parameters. See Accelerator's documentation for more information on animations. Next, we add event listeners for each of the animations, so that on complete, animation 1 calls animation 2, animation 2 calls animation 3, and animation 3 calls animation 1. So we've essentially created a little loop of animations that will continue to cycle through these colors. If we launch the app again in Titanium, we'll see that our new welcome page is displaying correctly, and our color cycle animation is working and repeating properly. Great! Let's move on to the videos. Our video loading code is going to be very similar to what we wrote in our iPhone app. We're going to create a video player using a URL we get from Blip TV. Again, we'll be using an HTTP client to get the video data from Blip TV. So we'll create a video player with the create video player command. Then, we'll create a video view with ti.ui.createView, setting its width to the detail window width and height to the correct height for our video aspect ratio, which is 16 by 9. Then, we add the video player to our video view. We then set the top for our web view to the height value for our video. This way, our web view window with show notes and the script will fit below the video. 
In many instances, Titanium provides built-in activity indicators for things that are loading. But in this case, we're going to need to create our own. We'll use the Create Activity Indicator command. We'll then add it to our video view, but it won't become visible until we later call the show method. Now, we'll create a load video XHR HTTP client object, then create its onload function. We'll assign a variable called blipTVJSON to the JSON response we get by evaluating this.response text with the eval function. The blipTV API offers an array of additional media. These are the possible video formats that are available to us. Each media value in the array has a URL and a role. We want to find the role blip HD 720 and store the URL for that media. We'll do this by cycling through the blip TV JSON dot additional media array, looking for the role that matches blip HD 720. When we find it, we set our video player dot URL to that role's URL. After that loop, we're going to show the activity indicator. Then we'll add an event listener to the video player for when the video is playing. In this anonymous function, we'll tell the activity indicator to hide. So this activity indicator will only show between the time we set a new video URL and when the video actually starts playing. Next, we're going to add an event listener for when an orientation change occurs on the iPad. In this anonymous function, we're going to resize the video view's width and height and reset the web view's top. This is so that we're always fitting the video width to the detail window's width and then setting the other variables accordingly. Finally, inside Load Video XHR, we'll show the video player and play the video. In our iPhone app, we set up a click event listener on both the latest episodes table and the single topic table, which called a function Load Remote Movie. In this iPad app, we're going to set up a click event listener on these tables with a name function called load episode detail view. Before we create this function, we'll set a boolean variable first video to true. Now let's make our load episode detail view function. In it, we'll check if e.row.hasChild, just like in our iPhone app, which just checks to make sure that we're clicking on an episode row and not a blank row. Next, we check if we are online with ti.network.online. If not, we'll call our not connected alert function, which presents an alert box to the user. We check the first video boolean we created just a minute ago, which will be true the first time we hit this if statement. If true, we'll add the video view to the detail window and set first video to false. So next time this function is called, we'll only stop the video player instead of adding the video view again, which we won't need to do. After this first video check, we'll call load remote movie and load web view, passing through the episode object from the row passed into this function. Now, let's create our load remote movie function above load episode detail view. Our load remote movie function will look similar again to what we had in our iPhone app. We'll open and send our load video XHR HTTP client. As we said before, we need to make sure that we're on a Wi-Fi network since our video hosting service doesn't currently support HTTP live streaming. So we have to make sure video playback only happens on a Wi-Fi network. We do this by checking if the network type is of type ti.network.networkWiFi. If the user isn't on Wi-Fi, we'll present an alert to notify them. In our load web view function, we'll set the URL for our web view to a URL string that we'll build with episode.slug plus a .app extension. To create this URL, we need to get the episode slug. To get it, we need to go back a few lines of code into our function episodes to data. In it, you'll see that we're creating row objects, setting several parameters. Our episode JSON that's coming into this function contains a bunch of information about each episode, including the slug we need. So let's add a new line inside create table view row, setting episode to episode. So now this episode variable will be saved in each row. Okay, great. So let's go back down to our load web view function. Next, we have another Boolean check to see if the welcome screen is showing with screencast's image is loaded, and if true, we remove screencast's image and set the boolean to false. 
Then, we set the title and bar color for our detail window to variables passed in from the row data. Then, we set master pop-up visible to false in our split window, which removes the menu popover if the iPad is in portrait mode. Then, we have to set it back to true again so that the next time through this function, we're able to toggle it to false again. This may seem like odd behavior, but it's just how Titanium works apparently. If we launch the app again in Titanium, we'll now see that clicking on an episode row correctly opens the video and web view in our detail view. Great! We can see the show notes and full script for each episode, and watch the video full screen if desired. And that's it! This app is available now in the App Store under the name Screencasts HD, so be sure to check it out there. Thanks for watching! Subscribe to our RSS feed, follow us on Twitter, and please leave any comments, questions, or suggestions for new screencasts in the comments below. If you like our videos and think your friends, followers, or colleagues would benefit from seeing them, please feel free to share via any of the links below the video. We really appreciate your support. See you next time! Help support Screencasts.org by purchasing the Screencasts iPhone and iPad apps, available through the App Store and iTunes. You can also donate directly via PayPal in the sidebar. Thanks in advance for helping us share this content.